Um, before I introduce uh, Howard Reingold, I want to comment that it's, it's very hard to look into the future and predict it as it is, but if you can manage to uh, think about it and write a book or books and still have that be relevant three years, five years, ten years, or fifteen years later, you've accomplished something uh, pretty significant. Um, early on in my career, years and years ago, um, some of the things that Howard wrote were uh, influential to me. <clears throat> they opened up my eyes, and I guess uh, it, it was pretty much an early uh, an influence on th the way I think and the way I approach and perceive things, this particular industry. So it's very much a personal honor uh, to be able to introduce Howard. Uh, Howard wrote about the future of personal computers in 1995 with his book, Tools for Thought. Uh, he introduced the term virtual community back in 1987. 87, think about that for a minute, 20, 20 couple years. <laughs> it's been a long weekend. Um, and in 1993, he published the book, The Virtual Community. Um, he was the editor of the Whole Earth Review and the Millennium Whole Earth Catalog, as well as uh, being the founding executive, ec executive editor of Hotwired. And his book, Smart Mobs, was published in 2002. Um, again, you should go out and read these things. They're still relevant today. Uh, he teaches social media and digital journalism at Stanford and UC Berkeley and was an awardee of the MacArthur Foundation's first digital media and learning competition in 2008. These, uh, it's, it's very significant, and again, I'm very, very proud and honored to introduce Howard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is fantastic. I smiled um, when Yuri asked me to, uh, to come here today, um, doing my email, sitting on my lawn with my laptop. Um, first of all, I love Amsterdam. I came here first time 20 years ago in, because I was investigating virtual reality for a book and was on my way to Eindhoven and discovered Amsterdam on the way. I, I'm, as you will see, I'm very interested in where things came from as well as where they're going to. So I'm, I love the fact that so much of the modern world was invented here. And I, I love all of the, the hospitality that I've received uh, Every night, I've been here for a week, so, and what a great week uh, to be here. Every night I've been here, um, I, I've had a great experience uh, uh, with people. The other reason I smiled was because um, Yuri challenged me to do something I've never done before and quite possibly will not do again, which is to revisit Smart Mobs and talk about what's happened since I wrote it and talk about what might be happening next. Uh, so I wrote Smart Mobs. The publishing industry is extraordinarily slow to get things on paper, which makes it difficult if you're writing about the future. You really have to try to get ahead of it. Um, I wrote the book in 2001. It was published in 2002. So that was seven years ago. Um, a lot of the things I'm going to say about what I forecast then don't seem very futuristic. They become part of our lives. And I've noticed, in fact, that I don't know whether this is a, a very modern phenomenon, but there's kind of a rolling amnesia for how miraculous things were. You know, there was a time at which people got lost because they didn't have maps to where they were going. Um, there was a time at which people didn't carry their, their maps along with them that had a little line or even a little voice that told them where to go. It's completely um, accepted now. Uh, I'm going to make a big assumption, and that assumption is that um, more people have read or are aware of smart mobs here than are not. So I'm not really going to tell that story, but I want to very briefly, in just a, a minute or two, go through a, a few of the signals that led me to start writing that book, because I don't really have a vision of the future to present here today. I am going to, I, I hope, feed your collective intelligence with some signals. Um, that's the way I do it. I don't really have a methodology other than stumbling on things and getting curious about them and finding out who knows something about that and trying to, to connect the dots into a larger picture. I really appreciated uh, Joe's talk because so often you don't see such a large vision of, of where we are and, and where we're going. So this started uh, for me, actually, it's been, been mentioned before, I think, Alan, um, Oops. Al, um, 
Uh-huh. I, keep, I keep pressing the wrong button here. Okay. Um, Alan mentioned that texting um, SMS was not a big thing in the USA for a number of reasons. But in 2000, when much of the world was uh, exchanging SMS messages, you did not see that in the US. And when I arrived in Tokyo, those of you who have had the experience, you, you take the train in from the airport, and, and when you get out of the subway, you are immersed in the world. That's Tokyo, very, very different from, from uh, Amsterdam, certainly different from San Francisco as well. I couldn't help notice that people were walking down the street looking at their phones. A very strange sight for an American back then. Um, something I didn't really think about twice, but it happened um, just by happenstance that I was in uh, Helsinki, other side of the world, very different culture, a couple of weeks later, and couldn't help notice sitting at a cafe that three teenagers came by and were showing the screen of their phone to each other and, and smiling. Something was going on there. Not, those were two interesting signals, and I, I guess my, my interest level rose, but it, it really didn't become a conscious thought that there's something larger uh, happening here until I read about what, what happened in the Philippines. Um, I, I, I won't get into the whole story, but there was, were demonstrations that were triggered by a corruption investigation against the, the President, Joseph Estrada. People flooded into the main square there within minutes of the investigation being shut down um, in the Congress there because they exchanged uh, SMS messages. Mi millions of people, um, um, uh, millions of, uh, tens of millions of, of messages uh, that, that were instrumental in bringing down the Estrada uh, regime. It occurred to me that these are points on a line, or maybe they define a plane. Something is going on here with people walking around looking at their phones and, and teenagers showing their phone screens to each other, and suddenly this, this mass manifestation. Uh, there were other signals, but I went around and, and asked uh, a few people what they thought was happening, and I happened to, uh, upon one person who I had talked to before about uh, the, the virtual community phenomenon, a sociologist. I am not a, a sociologist, and he said, it looks to me like a threshold for collective action has been lowered by the technology. And I think, it's, I think it's interesting to think about that. Technology didn't cause these things to happen, but it enabled people to do things that people wanted to do but were not able to do um, before. So smart mobs is really shorthand, not just about the mobile space, but about, and, and I'll get into this, because I think the, the, the mobile device and the, and the internet and the cloud are, are moving faster together. And one of the things that I didn't get was how slow um, that convergence would be. But one, besides the, the fact that it's simply uh, a term for people using uh, modern media to coordinate uh, collective action, for, for better and for worse, and the beginning of an evolution that I think that we're, we're uh, right in the middle of, was the idea that for a lot of people didn't really sink in then that the the mobile telephone, personal computer, and the internet were merging into a new medium that had its own specific affordances. So I'd written about the, the digital computer being the universal machine. That's the specific affordance of the, of the PC. You can make it do anything that you can write a program for. And about, I th still think, the internet's great affordances to enable people who don't know each other to connect because they have something in common. And I made the claim then, and I, I think it's still largely true, that the affordance of this new medium that is unique to it is that it does enable and lower the threshold for collective action, and not just political, but economic, uh, social, and cultural. So back then I wrote that uh, the PC was, uh, it's about where the PC was in 1980. Um, some of you are old enough to remember what it was like to measure your, your RAM in, in kilobytes, um, have these big floppy disks. Who could have foreseen uh, that you would have more computing power than NASA had um, in, in your pocket in, in a few years? And I can remember when uh, the internet was uh, light green letters on dark green screens. Who could have anticipated YouTube and the rest of it? So I just, I think, we're in the middle of it now, and to me, the iPhone 
not necessarily the most advanced technology. Certainly, I think people here um, share some mixed feelings about how open and how closed the iPhone is. But as an image of a device that's not the phone as we've known it, I think that has really alerted the world to the fact that something new is happening here. So I started looking around for other examples of uh, technology-enabled collective action. I, 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 of course, I think distributed computing is another example of that. And I think in the mobile world, the ability for people to voluntarily pool the computing power that they have in their, in their pockets is, has, uh, I think, presently unforeseeable consequences. Right now, the largest supercomputers in the world are those in which people voluntarily pool their computing power to search for signals from outer space or to help biochemists understand how protein molecules fold or to, to uh, model weather patterns uh, to, in order to try to understand the changing climate. Um, Wikipedia, knowledge aggregation. The reason we all know about this, the reason I, I, I raise this is that when I started looking into collective action theory and sociology for the last hundred years has really been about how is it that people do things together? What, what are the di dynamics of that? Classic collective action theory, Mankar Olson will tell you that of a, a group of people um, over the, the size of, let's say, this audience here, who don't know each other, are for a number of reasons not capable of creating public goods. Um, clearly, there's something wrong with collective uh, action theory. There's a real challenge for future sociologists. Um, after my book was published, so let's talk about the things I got right. The idea of uh, political, self-organized collective action, uh, democratic, peaceful, and otherwise, I think has now become almost commonplace. So uh, I think probably none of these examples are new to you, but I think in the aggregate, and I've left a, a lot of them out, it, it shows that people are using particularly SMS, but Increasingly, they're using maps and other mobile or cloud technologies to self-organize political action. So this is a demonstration in the streets of Korea when they tried to impeach President Roe, um, now the late um, ex-President Roe. But in fact, that election was tipped on election day because uh, the Oh My News site sent out a, a message to all of the citizen journalists uh, that participated in it to get all their friends to go out and vote. Our guy is losing. And he gave them his first uh, interview. Um, I got this picture in my email. I got up in the morning and I knew something had happened in Madrid because people I didn't know were saying there's a smart mob in Madrid. We all remember, I'm sure, terrorist bombings and the train there. The government um, tried to blame it on the Basque uh, separatists because of the Spanish election laws. Uh, the election was only three days away. Public political demonstrations uh, were forbidden. So people sent each other messages saying, the government is lying to us. Go show up at their headquarters. And that's what uh, uh, that picture was. Um, the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine, um, also uh, organized by SMS. Um, maybe you've heard about subsequent uh, political attempts. Of course, the, the government um, in the Ukraine um, very quickly uh, became hip to this and began uh, forbidding things. Um, there were flash mobs, as they're now called, or organized by, by people uh, eating ice cream in the square, um, signaling that they protested what the government um, was doing. And people's ingenuity about, particularly I think what's true of all of these examples is the, the, the state or the government or our political leaders are lying to us and our political leaders or our media are not doing the job, and they take that uh, into their own hands. Um, I spoke in, in Chile um, last fall, and they said, oh, um, oh whoops, this is not Chile, this is, uh, this is Los Angeles. 20,000 high school students um, used MySpace to organize a walkout from their, their classes uh, to protest a proposed immigration law. Many of these students were afraid that their parents were going to be deported. Uh, so they um, used MySpace, they left their classrooms, they joined street demonstrations, they scared uh, 
legislators out of uh, passing any immigration uh, legislation. So I think you could say that they were successful in their, their political goals. And I think a good sign um, that the students, the young people, I'm certain none of them joined MySpace in order to do political activism. But they knew when they had a cause that was important to them that they could deploy the media that were at their disposal to, to organize. Um, and I wonder what kind of civic participation those students in that picture are going to have in the future. Certainly they felt empowered about this event. So Chile, um, I was there in September and people said, well, we had a smart mob here. They called it the Penguin Revolution. Um, the, the public school uh, children in, in Chile wear black and white uniforms, so that's why they call them penguins. And the funding for education in the public schools there is not very good at all. And the schools are not in very good condition, so anybody who can afford it sends their children to private schools. And the kids themselves took it upon themselves to do something about the situation. They um, used they used Photolog, um, which is kind of the uh, big in, in Latin America. They used YouTube and they used MSN Messenger. And uh, we're talking about 14 to 17 year olds. And they, they didn't just leave their classes to demonstrate. They locked the schools and they got tens of thousands of people onto the streets. The Minister of Education ended up resigning under political pressure. They started a process of talking about their priorities about education. I don't know whether that will ultimately be successful, but those, uh, this, this happened uh, four or five years ago. The, these students, um, who were 14 to 16 then, are now uh, in college, graduating from college and becoming political leaders. And, and I would bet that they're going to look back on this as one of the formative experiences of their uh, political careers, their civic awakening. China has always been good. The state has been very good at suppressing bad news that happens locally. When the SARS epidemic first started, uh, they tried to put the lid on the news that some new disease was emerging there. But 150 million SMS messages in three days made it really impossible to do that. Um, I could do a whole talk about what people in China are doing. There's a whole uh, uh, power and counterpower uh, drama going on there. Of course, there is an official uh, uh, rep repression uh, censorship apparatus there using both uh, automatic uh, recognition of certain words and the, the Great Firewall of China blocking access to certain sites and 40,000 humans telling people that the, what they're doing is incorrect. The Chinese word for what they are, um, for having to adjust your website because it's not um, politically correct, is harmonize. Um, but uh, nobody, I am told by my friends there, uh, nobody whose site has been censored really is silent about it. The word harmonize in Chinese sounds like the word for a river crab. So people put up a picture of a river crab on their website. So. Um, there's a big experiment going on there. Can you enable people to have uh, YouTube and Facebook and um, you know the Chinese equivalents of all of these uh, social networks and social media are inhabited by many more people than, than the rest of the world. Uh, it's still, I think, uh, larger than, than Facebook. We don't know how that experiment is going to turn out. Um, it's, it's uh, an experiment in progress. It, it may turn out that um, authoritarian control trumps smart mobs in that case. We saw emergent collective response by citizens around the world that we had never really seen before in the wake of the uh, Asian tsunami. The Asian tsunami blog was set up within hours that not only connected people uh, with news about missing relatives, enabled citizens around the world to raise money. In the US, uh, citizens raised more money than the US government had pledged for relief. And maybe that was a political embarrassment and the US raised um, its contribution. 
But it was people from all, all over the world, and it wasn't just money. There was somebody who said, I'm, I am building temporary housing in Indonesia. Somebody has uh, 10,000 nails uh, for me. Can, can you get them from the dock in, in Seattle to, to where I am in Indonesia? And a chain of people helped that happen. After Hurricane Katrina happened in the US, uh, people were scattered, didn't know where their family was. Many of them used digital means to try to contact each other, but they used a lot of different uh, media. They used Craigslist, they used Usenet. So uh, a, a group of geeks got together and, and created the Katrina People Finder, which was a wiki that enabled people to find their relatives. They had some problems getting the, the, all of the data to stream in quickly enough, and they had um, three or four engineers volunteered from one of the largest, most well-known database companies there who could not solve it. But suddenly, that bottleneck disappeared and the data started flowing in. Um, the organizers figured out who had done it and they, they called him and he said, sure, I can tell you how I did it. It's not that hard, but uh, my mom says I have to go to school now. It's 15 <laughs> years old. Emergent collective response on a global level, um, I think, is a huge new opportunity. There are some problems to be solved at the interface of uh, citizen response and official uh, response. And uh, it will be interesting to see how that works out because people aren't going to stop doing this. Jim Gray, computer scientist uh, for Microsoft Research, uh, took his sailboat out on the San Francisco Bay a couple of years ago, one afternoon, and did not return that evening, his friends organized an effort in which they got uh, satellite photos from three different satellites. Um, they got uh, Google and NASA to help them on that. They got Microsoft engineers and Amazon engineers to work together to divide this into uh, over half a million images. 12,000 volunteers went through those half a million images in a couple of days. Never found Jim Gray, but they put this all together ad hoc within hours. I think just, again, a signal that people are beginning to take the building blocks of what's available and connect with anybody else who's interested and put together something very, very rapidly that enables people to contribute. And you know, all of this, again, collective action theory, nobody is paying them to do this. They are working together to find this guy. A lot of people cared about him, probably not 12,000 people were personal friends of his. I think this is an image that's probably familiar to most people in the world. So again, this was an easy forecast in 2001. It's hard to believe that, that people did not immediately see this. I said, pretty soon there will be an event somewhere in the world of world news proportions, and the first thing we're going to see about it is going to be, come from somebody's camera phone. Um, of course, uh, so that was the, the um, London tube bombing of uh, 7 July, and, and this uh, picture uh, appeared on Flickr uh, with a uh, Creative Commons license and was picked up by the BBC and CNN and, and the rest of the world. Not a very good picture, but it was an immediate one. This man, George Allen, is not the senator uh, from Virginia. The Republicans do not have a majority in the Senate because at this very moment, he was uh, pointing out someone who was pointing a, uh, a camera video, um, a, a video uh, telephone at them and, um, and made a racist remark. And it showed up on YouTube and uh, George Allen lost. You know, since forever, politicians have been able to give different messages to different audiences and they know when they are on the media because there's a camera with a light on it and it usually has a little sign saying where it's from. But now it's anyone from anywhere at any time. I'm sure this is not making old school politicians comfortable, but I, 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 I'm quite sure that it's probably better for democracies. This picture. Um, so somebody on one of the ferries that was diverted when this plane went down um, sent this to Twitter via TwitPic. Again, a couple of years from now, this will be commonplace 
the idea that somebody forecasts this will, be, will seem silly. Um, so the Obama campaign. You know, the, we wouldn't be talking about social media and political campaigns if Obama had lost. Um, after the Howard Dean campaign, there was a lot of talk about the echo chamber and about how um, blogging is not enough. And in fact, that is correct. And the Obama campaign, uh, I think, combined traditional um, hierarchical uh, political election tactics with self-organized grassroots social media uh, driven tactics. They came into a state with their official campaign machinery to find that there were 20 or 30 or 200 offices that had already been set up by people who had already coordinated um, through, through blogs, um, through Twitter, through Facebook, and, and uh, through Meetup. And now we're seeing another experiment, which is the Obama administration uh, at least attempting to use media to, um, to make the workings of the state transparent. You know, the whole notion of the public sphere underlying uh, democracy, much of which uh, developed here, has to do with the idea that citizens somehow get s information about the workings of the state. Presumably that's the role of the press. Um, and there's some questions about that future. And that people can form public opinion, that public opinion can, can influence uh, policy. Uh, a person that I know, uh, Beth Novak, who was at NY uh, Law School, uh, wrote a book recently called Wiki Governance. Uh, and she's now in the White House. So we'll see how this succeeds. Another experiment in, in progress. I want to emphasize, um, I don't want to paint a happy picture of uh, human beings doing all kinds of wonderful altruistic things together because media enables them. Human beings do destructive things together and media augments it. As Jemay uh, pointed out, um, the ability of terrorists and criminals is augmented uh, as well. So some the demonstrations around the publication of the Muhammad cartoons, uh, people were summoned to those uh, via SMS. There were riots uh, around the Miss World uh, pageant in uh, Nigeria, which people were summoned by SMS. Can't really have a riot unless a, a sufficient critical mass of people who are willing to go beyond the limits of the law show up at the same place at the same time. You need to, to assemble those people very quickly. Racists, white racists in Australia, summon people to beat up non-whites on the beach using SMS. A, a, a fair number of examples. Political demonstrations, not always peaceful. Mo Moldova, a lot of social media involved in that. Um, Twitter involved in that, not nonviolent. So, um, Alan mentioned technologies of cooperation. One of the things I didn't know when I started out, I thought I was writing about the merger of mobile media and the internet, was that I ended up b believing that really what these technologies are uncovering is how much we don't know about how people can do things together and how media can afford more powerful forms of collective action. So I just sketched this out because I have an intuition, nothing scientific about this, strictly by the seat of my pants, that there are a number of specific design affordances that enable these technologies to amplify collective action. So these are just the, my first, off the top of my head, uh, guesses at what some of those affordances are. And I think it's a great opportunity either for a, a student or a scientist or a startup or an existing company's research laboratory to really look more deeply and see whether, in fact, we can understand these affordances well enough to begin designing media that enable new forms of, of collective action. You know, Flickr actually started as a spin-off of a game. Um, did anybody here ever play game Never Ending? Okay, nobody here. Anybody here use Flickr? So Flickr was a way for people in the game to share photographs. And um, 
Stuart and Katerina were smart enough to, to recognize this was the tail that wags the dog, that in fact, sharing photographs and tagging them so that people can find photographs was something important. You know, the Clay Shirky talks about cats and sinks. If you, you search for cats and sinks, you will find that there is a community worldwide who take pictures of cats and sinks and a lot of other things. The reason I believe that both the, the profit making and the, the, the non-profit uh, ventures that have succeeded in this sphere have succeeded because they have created platforms for part participation so that individuals could act in their own self-interest. We all want to share our, our, our photos with our friends. We want to tag them so we can find them. But in a way that what they do in the aggregate becomes a public good that's more valuable um, for everybody. I don't think we know how many of those uh, we can yet create. So I became convinced that we need a new way of thinking about how humans do things together. And I was reminded of, again, here in the Netherlands 500 years ago, Rene Descartes saying, I don't think any of our notions about how the world works, how the natural world works, are accurate. Um, we need a whole new way of thinking about that. And of course, the scientific method and biology and microscopes, again, the Netherlands, enabled eventually biologists to notice that it was microorganisms, um, not uh, foreigners, not sin, um, not witchcraft, that was causing their kids to die. Um, we've got huge problems. The, the, the climate problem is a classic social dilemma. We would all like to not alter the atmosphere, but most of us, probably all of us, would like to drive our automobiles. So that's a, the, the, the classic social dilemma. How do, how do we solve that? Is a, a, a big collective action problem. Conflict, um, resource uh, uh, questions, these all have to do with knowledge that I don't think we have. So I worked with the Institute for the Future for about three years for government clients, for uh, private industry, and for uh, philanthropic foundations, all the, the three different uh, spheres from which you can get money to, to do research. Um, and we, we put our findings on this website, cooperationcommons.com. We taught a, a course at Stanford. I na naively believed, because I had not yet become involved with universities, that an interdisciplinary study of cooperation and collective action would be enormously important, and we needed to, to start this right away. And I now realized that there are perverse incentives in all of our knowledge creating institutions. Nobody really in universities or in um, research laboratories for uh, corporations or for foundations that sponsor research thinks um, we're going to create roadblocks for interdisciplinary work. It's simply that in order to advance in any field, you really need to do better and better and more and more narrow work. And the more power, money, and prestige you have, uh, the more you have to risk by stepping outside of that that field. Ah, hell. I pressed the wrong button again. What do I, what do I press on here? So, um, so after about four years of this, I realized, OK, this is not going to happen maybe in my lifetime. Um, OK. Um, but I was happy to see um, very recently that Yohai Benkler, um, whose uh, book, um, Wealth of Networks, I think is a, a real advance in, in thinking about this field, has started um, the Cooperation Project as an interdisciplinary community of researchers, projects, and practitioners engaged in studying the underlying factors that contribute to human cooperation at the Berkman Center at Harvard. So maybe this will happen a little more rapidly I'm not saying that world peace is going to break out if we understand cooperation and collective action, but I would rather not um, drive on a bridge that was designed by an engineer who had not studied the properties of materials. So I think with a new way of thinking and new knowledge, we will see new ways to do things. So um, 
Let's talk about some of the things that, that I didn't get right and some of the, the signals of where we may be going. So I interviewed Natsuno-san, who's the kind of the um, resident genius at Docomo, uh, which created iMode, which was a big deal in the, in the, the development of uh, mobile linking with the internet. And this is a slide I got from them in 2001. So, and Natsuno-san very clearly had a vision of the mobile phone as a remote control for the rest of the world, that we would have uh, devices and chips and everything, and we would be able to use our uh, mobile devices to control those. Uh, there was a lot of thought that there would be RFID tags and everything, there would be embedded chips everywhere. That really has not happened so much. So also, you can see from this uh, uh, vision here that they were talking about information being linked with places. So several of the things that I wrote about seven years ago that haven't actually happened yet had to do with um, not just the social world, but the connection with the technological world. We really haven't seen an internet of things yet. We really haven't seen the uh, telephone being a remote control for a variety of technologies in the environment yet. Um, it's not clear exactly uh, at what pace it's going to happen, but I feel relatively certain that seven years from now, uh, we're going to see a lot more action um, in that regard. Augmented reality, 2001. So uh, Scott Fisher, one of the pioneers in virtual reality, experimenting uh, with augmented reality at Keio University outside of Tokyo. I went to visit him there and he got me set up with his, this outfit that not only knew where I was, but knew where I was looking, and in fact overlaid information about the world on, on a headset. Scott is very dedicated to the head-mounted display vision, and I think uh, it's becoming clear that the head-mounted display, or even the glasses, is probably a very small uh, uh, proportion of what is going to happen with uh, uh, augmented reality. So I think that clearly, the next seven years is going to see a, a, a much more rapid growth in those aspects that I talked about in 2001, but which have not happened. And I think there are, we, can, we can identify some of the reasons for it, that it's going, we're going to have an augmented experience. It's going to be situated not only um, where we are, but what the, the context of the devices around us uh, might be. And as always, uh, driven by social communication. There's, remember Mo So So, uh, mobile social software? I mean, that's really an old term. It's so old, nobody uses it anymore. And it never happened, but maybe it's beginning to. So just a few examples. I'm going to really quickly go through them, because we're going to see a lot more about uh, augmented reality soon. But again, the window on the world. Um, and uh, information that is associated with a particular location um, is now available. Um, Wikitude has been mentioned before. I mean, th this is a, a great mashup that takes the location information and the, uh, this, this device has a magnetometer so it knows um, where you're pointing it and just brings information from Wikipedia. And if you think about the kinds of mashups that are uh, going to be possible, I think that we're going, we're, it, it's unclear, just like Flickr, what innovations are really going to take off in that sphere. Here's somebody using an, an, a, a G1 that has a, a magnetometer in it as a metal detector. Who knows what you would do with a, a metal detector. Um, here's a site for people to monitor uh, devices in environments and to tag and map them. Who knows uh, what you're going to do with that. But again, I'm talking about signals. So just as people looking at their phones in the street, uh, the political demonstrations, those were a couple of signals that I extrapolated from. I don't have an extrapolation, but I, again, I, I hope that I'm feeding your collective intelligence with a number of data points, some of which you may not already be aware of, that 
could lead some of you to invent some of the reasons that we're going to do this stuff. Um, so Nokia is offering uh, real-time traffic information now. Another thing like maps, I think, will become a very accepted part of life is that uh, some device in your automobile is going to say, in real time, uh, take another route. Um, so mobile social software, I interviewed a guy in Tokyo uh, in 2001 who had something called Imahima that used something of a, 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 a bulky um, uh, and, and cumbersome method for letting other people know via your, your, your mobile device where you were. So now we're seeing Google uh, Latitude. I think this is a little bit like looking at the 1984 Macintosh, but it, it, it is, I think, a sign that we're, we are really beginning to see um, location-based services and mashups happening. I'm particularly interested in the mashups that, that certainly we have seen with many of these devices, the, the design genius of a company um, like Apple. Um, but so many of these examples come from people taking bits and pieces and putting them together in ways that, that make unexpected experiences. Dan Gilmore teaches journalism. One of the obstacles, one of the critical uncertainties, of course, is the operators. The mobile, the role of the mobile operator, I think, has a lot to do with why the mobile web um, did not take off uh, and expand and create wealth the way the, um, the web that did not have operators as bottlenecks did. But so your, your camera has uh, increasingly location-specific information in it. And um, Flickr and uh, Google Maps enables you to put those together. So he e equipped a group of journalism students with, uh, with Google phones. And they went out and they did a little story about a neighborhood um, collectively within an hour and were, were able to publish it. Again, an early look at a kind of uh, collective action as citizen journalism using location specific technologies. Okay, some of these signals I picked up the week before I came here. Some of them I picked up uh, sitting in my hotel room yesterday, so I need to refer to some of my notes here. But this is, this is one. I, I didn't realize that Vodafone was a sponsor here, but this actually is something that the, the UN Foundation and the Vodafone Foundation have been supporting called the Epi Surveyor Program, which uses mobile t technology to track and contain disease in developing nations. So in a, uh, one of the few places in the world where polio is still a, a, a danger of academic, there, uh, epidemic, there was a uh, polio outbreak in Kenya, and uh, EpiSurveyor's platform was used to track both virus carriers and immunize uh, affected uh, school children, two million uh, Kenyan school children. Jack Dorsey, the guy who created Twitter, did the original little drawing that I'm sure many of you have seen. Now he, he's working on, on something uh, called Squirrel. Um, that's a, a little device that enables people to swipe credit cards and uh, take payments through the iPhone. I think we saw from, what was it, CM is the, the, the name of the company um, that, that made an announcement before. We are seeing payment systems, whether you swipe credit cards or use other kinds of payments, uh, beginning to emerge. Interestingly, it's been mentioned before, in Europe, um, in Japan, USA, we have failed to see uh, the mobile device be a carrier for, um, for financial transactions. A lot of reasons for that. Obviously, banks have uh, a lot of interest in keeping transactions a little bit slower than that. But as has been mentioned, poor people in Africa for whom a uh, $5 worth of minutes is worth something, have found a way to create a, a currency uh, from, from the bottom up and use it um, quite effectively. To, as long as there's one phone in a village, you can transfer what to us are small amounts of money and what to them are not small amounts of money. So Iqbal Qadir, the, uh, the, the visionary behind the Grameen phone that uh, enables micro-enterprises to uh, to uh, finance 
one woman in a village to have the mobile phone in that village and to charge people for it, make a living for herself and connect people with their families elsewhere and with spot labor, information, agricultural information, kind of information that's really important if you're trying to subsist. And he really strongly believes, if you look at his uh, TED Talk video, that development funds are um, not the way to develop uh, people who are really uh, poor, but outside of cities. Besides corruption, there's the fact that that kind of capital concentrates in cities, does not get out into the countryside. Give people in the countryside access to affordable mobile communications, and they will develop themselves. That's Iqbal uh, Kadir's uh, position on that. And again, an experiment in, progr in progress, and I think we're going to see some very interesting things coming from that part of the world. Um, subsistence farmers have important information that they don't have access to and are consistently screwed by the middleman. Um, commodity prices, do I walk for three hours in this direction with, with my, my produce, or do I walk for three hours in that direction? That makes the difference between feeding your kids or not. In Smart Mobs, I wrote about a fisherman off the coast of India, able to get a simple SMS message with, with one bit of information. Does this port have fishing boats already come to this port and therefore I won't be able to get a price for my catch? Or should I go to another port and again, feed my children? One bit of information is extremely important if you are a, a um, subsistence farmer or, or you're fishing. A lot of these people are illiterate. The mobile phone can offer information, um, critical information about the weather, about commodity prices, about the spot labor market, um, via voice, via simple voice systems. People can ask questions and get answers very rapidly, and it's a platform for learning how to read. So the very simple, inexpensive mobile phone, the next two billion that the phone companies are gearing up to sell in the fastest growing markets in the world, um, India is the fastest growing uh, market in the world, are um, also learning platforms. And I think that if you think about the problems we have today, and you think about the number of people out there who might have great ideas for solving those problems, but don't have access to the rest of us, this may be an important platform. Um, mobile voices um, enables uh, uh, people, uh, low cost open source platform for immigrant day laborers in Los Angeles to create, share, and publish multimedia stories directly from their mobile devices. Uh, the week before I left uh, for Amsterdam, the Open Mobile Consortium uh, announced uh, its opening. So there are activists who are trying to catalyze this process of social change, um, economic and political social change using mobile technologies. Ushahidi, um, Alan mentioned Ushahidi. This is a slightly different slide of Ushahidi. Uh, Crisis mapping enables people on the ground to say that there's a human rights violation going on here in my village days before some journalist is able to get there and report on it. And they're able to put it on a map. So there are a couple of reasons for doing this. One is that it brings awareness of a potential problem to the, to the world much faster. But it also creates situational awareness um, for people on the ground who never before had access to information about, you don't want to go to this part of your, your own country right now. Again, I think you have to look at this as an, an early example. And again, I caution that um, this is not a solution to uh, human rights violations, um, but it's part of the solution. Uh, people in Africa are able to uh, become citizen reporters. Huge uh, growth in penetration of mobile devices, in increasing bandwidth and capability of sending uh, reports in. So if you're going to think about where we're going in the future, we have to assume that the uh, hardware and software and bandwidth uh, are, are going to progress much more quickly over the next seven years than they have over the, the last uh, seven years. And I think that we have to think about the, some way of merging 
the capabilities of the device in your hand and the computation capabilities in the cloud. So this is a, a, a picture from uh, a Clone Cloud, which some Intel, this is a research pro, uh, uh, project, which some Intel engineers have a system in which uh, a clone of your mobile device is kept in the cloud. And if there is uh, a computation intensive application like facial recognition, um, it recognizes that your onboard computing power isn't enough. The computation happens in the cloud and it tells you who this guy is. So other crazy ideas. So our devices know where we are. We know we're pointing, where we're pointing them. Will they know what we're looking at? So eye tracking technology has been around for a long time, but two weeks ago, this report about Apple buying uh, eye tracking uh, technology. If they do with eye tracking what they did with uh, video cameras in laptop devices, we may see, not in the early part of the next seven years, but in the late part of the next seven years, that they are, it's economic enough for your mobile device to know where you're looking. In terms of how likely is this to happen, it's a complete guess on my part. It's just a, a wild card that, that I, I, I picked out of the information stream. I turned to a, per, a person I've known for uh, 20 years who has been concentrating on health informatics that whole time. I emailed him and I said, do you think mobile devices have any applications in the really uh, ap real applications, um, economically viable applications in the, the uh, uh, near future with, with, with mobile devices and health, and he sent me these slides. So obviously he's really thinking um, about all of the things that you can monitor inexpensively um, and relatively accurately and transmit to a medical facility via mobile device um, pretty much right now. The, this is an, an application um, for the iPhone that, that connects a glucose meter to the iPhone. So you can report, if you're a diabetic, you can, you can have reports on um, the, the state of your, your blood sugar. Huge problem in the developed world. Diabetes is um, largely a result of, of diet and lack of exercise. And it's very expensive if you don't know you have it until you end up in an emergency room and then the whole society pays for it. I think it would pay for insurance companies to give out phones with uh, glucose meters to people saying, we'll pay for your phone, we'll pay for your service, but you have to test your blood sugar and listen to health messages uh, if, if they uh, are over a, a certain um, level. Uh, here's a device that's, that's using low cost um, ultrasonic uh, imaging. So clearly we are seeing in the health field the beginnings of the mobile device connecting the in a number of different ways, hospitals, doctors, and public health with uh, individuals in real time. So again, I asked somebody, again, Institute for the Future, Mike, Mike Leopold, um, used to be with Netscape before that. He was one of the people at Apple who, who uh, lobbied the US Congress for Wi-Fi. Uh, so I asked him, What's, why hasn't this happened? And he said, it's because of the social dilemma I've mentioned social dilemmas before. Social dilemmas happen all the time. It's, it's the collision between uh, self-interest and a, a much larger pie. Um, and so this is the dilemma for mobile networks. They need to recover network expenses by offering their own enhanced services while limiting the performance of web-based mobile services. So I don't know whether it's Vodafone, but some operator is going to, to take the leap from this social dilemma and maybe become a platform and may, maybe not become um, obsolete. So this is, this is Mike's vision that he's been uh, thinking about for a, n a number of years is f to, to enlist a mobile operator. Once one succeeds at this, the others are going to have to get into it in creating a, an, an ecology like Docomo did in which they take a piece of the action. It's unclear to me, I'm not an expert on the industry, whether that's going to happen. But I think certainly one of the obstacles to a lot of the things that I forecast in 2001, ha having happened by now, um, have to do with the mobile operators. There were, there were no operators in the internet space that you had to go through to get um, backplane information like, like uh, GPS. 
So coming to the end here, um, what am I doing now? Um, I've become convinced after years of writing about PCs and social communication online and smart mobs, the questions I get from groups like this, from critics, from academic scholars, and that I ask myself is, is this stuff any good for us um, as individuals, for our relationships, for our communities and society? And I've, I'm convinced that the answer is that depends on who knows what. That I wrote in Smart Mobs that the next revolutions are going, not going to be hardware or software, but in social uh, practices. I think we're con going to continue to see people communicating with each other in new ways and inventing new ways to communicate, just as hashtags were not invented by Twitter but by users. But I think we've reached the level of complexity where if you really um, need, want to know how to m take advantage of the technologies that are now available to most of the world, you need to have a certain amount of knowledge of how to use it. And certainly, young people teach each other, a lot of people teach each other, but there are a whole lot of literacies that I've seen since I started walking into classrooms and looking at students, not looking at me, looking at their laptops, uh, that about attention literacy. I know because I have watched them, I have videoed them, there are some of those students, a small number of those students are able to multitask and participate in what's going on in the classroom very effectively. But because I've watched them, because I've videoed them, and because they have self-reported on it, most of them admit that multitasking in a classroom means paying less attention to what's going on in the class. And so my question there is, um, is multitasking uh, essentially um, ineffective in terms of, of degrading individual performance? Or is it a skill that nobody has learned how to do, except some of these kids have learned how to do it very well? So I think there's a, a literacy around attention. I wrote a piece um, a couple of weeks ago on Twitter literacy. Um, I think network literacy is, is, is part of it. Participatory media, cooperation and collaboration. Search and credibility. I think the first thing you need to teach your eight-year-old before they get online is how do you find anything you want to know and how do you know that what you find is true? Um, no, none of this is taught. By the time I get students, we're talking about Stanford and Berkeley, you would think. Um, they have their laptops and they Facebook and they I am, they don't really Twitter. But that does not necessarily know that, mean that they know how to use a blog to advocate or that they've ever heard of RSS or that, uh, that they know how to use wikis for collaboration. Many of them say, wiki, sure, Wikipedia. They aren't even aware that they can edit Wikipedia. So I think that there's a, a huge need. Um, most of us know uh, these literacies. Um, I've discovered by facing students that not everybody is like me and all of my friends online. In fact, a lot of people, most people, the overwhelming majority of people who have access to technologies, we're talking about approaching four billion mobile phones, billion people on the internet, really know how to make use of them to their advantage. So that's what I'm working on now. Um, this MacArthur Foundation enabled me to work with a developer to create a free open source social media classroom for teachers. Um, you can go to socialmediaclassroom.com and find out more about it. And that's the 30,000, 60,000 uh, foot uh, overview of uh, where we've come and where we might be going. So next are some questions. Ms. Howard, since we're really running out of time, there's only room for one question, unfortunately, and it's a combined question raised by people on Twitter. Interesting for now. Um, we are a trending to topic at this moment, uh, hashtag MomoAmps, and therefore the, the channel is being spammed big time with fake news messages, porn, etc. It has been raised by several people on Twitter. What's, how should we deal with this? <laughs> Boy, if I had the answer to spam, would I be standing here? right now. But, but it's you know, a smart mob thing, it's a social thing. And well, you know, if, no, if, 
if nobody responded to spam, then it wouldn't be an effective channel. The problem is that a very, very low response rate is, is all you need. But I do, I do think that there, there has to be a, a, a difference between people who know not to respond, not to allow it, to block it, and, and a population of people who would simply allow, allow it uh, to happen uh, to them. And I think knowing how to filter your information is uh, very much a part of network literacy. Okay, thank you very much, Howard.